camera here. And action. Thomas! Sniper! You put the German in the back. I'll cover with the biggest. You take the wheel. Understood. Come on, Mark. Ow! Go! Cut! Uh, hi, I'm Matt Poitras, um, director, uh, editor, and producer, and I also play uh, Corporal Auckland. Sniper! And uh, prop and costume designer as well, and I've made that monstrosity behind me, which we call the PKD for short. Uh, long version is Panzer Kugel drone, which means uh, armored sphere drone. This is like about a month of work right here. Yeah. Like, right? Is that about when yeah. I started it? Like we all would ago. agree with that. Yeah. Do you want that inside? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's what she said. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Where's this kill bot? <laughs> Quite the technical. Wonder. I, yeah, the, te the tech monster here. All right, so this tank right here is, the main jet here is actually the Stunt double hand from this, which Vernon Wells wore in No Chance. All right. In your wildest wet dreams, there is. Oh, yeah. What is this, Matt? Uh, this is a PKD, which is a Panzer Kugel drone. Oh. It took me about like kind of two months of solid work to, to make uh, the stunt version, which has like the limbs that you can um, animate and the eye apparatus and stuff like that. The hero version is behind me and that's the one that has the full jetpack in the back. Right, rolling camera and action. Just go to the right. Put your ding dong in there. You whack <laughs> off. <laughs> no! My girlfriend could use this. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> I'm just gonna do some fine sanding on it, the surface, uh, to wear to wear down the smoothness of it because paint will tend not to stick to something that's smooth. And this thing's fucking great.
getting this thing to move properly was the biggest pain in the butt. I mean, we had, I think the first shoot, it was just on a stand or a, uh, somebody was hand holding it. Second time we brought it out, we had two guys holding it with like a, a jig I made and a uh, guy in the editing room immediately realized that motion was not good. Luckily, uh, some guy I know did me a real solid and let us borrow a jib. Action. Cut. Let's try one where you just keep it, keep it low. Okay. <clears throat> camera and action. Jammed? Ah, uh, looks like my nails went. Yeah, I might have double fed again. All right, fuck it. Let's move on. Basically what the PKD is, a, is a floating weapons platform. So it has a machine gun on it. That's a caseless ammunition machine gun, so there's no shells ejecting. Uh, the ammunition's small, so it can, it can hold a lot and the drum mag that's on the side, which is just like an MG34, MG42 mag. And then it has a fixed uh, barrel uh, that's like, kind of like set to like the eye, so wherever it turns, that semi-automatic gun can, can fire. It's kind of a, a little bit of a sniper rifle, it has more of a long range. And then on the side, it has two sets of six rockets that are like, uh, kind of like uh, grenades, I guess. Um, they're actually just, uh, Russian BOG grenades that I had cast uh, left over from another project. Secondary PKD that we see at some point has a flamethrower on the bottom of it. And that's the thing that we're saying kind of attacked long range desert group base camp that they were at. She's not feral because she's friendly, but uh, we feed her. She can't come in the house because I'm allergic to her. But uh, yeah, you know, I'm I'm real flexible with what you want to do with it. Because any of this stuff, you know, like uh, um, the serial numbers and shit like that, you just go right over that. Yeah, I can I can uh, make covers for these to make them presentable. Tell me a little bit about the Jeep. Uh, it's Jeep CJ2A, uh, 1947, if I remember right. I bought it for five grand off a guy up in Colorado, Grand Junction, Colorado, in the middle of the winter. It was an adventurous trip through the Rockies. I bought it just for a run-around vehicle when I was running around at events in something that looked World War II-ish, you know, because it's almost the same as World War II Jeep, minor differences. This was one of the last vehicles that I drove before I ended up in the hospital all the time, and it's the first one I've started. I couldn't do something like this, like working on this thing right there. Actually, this is the first thing that I've actually tried to do on any of my vehicles since all of this crap started, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I haven't been able to use it for a couple of years because of my health. So uh, they did a bunch of testing on me and found out my immune system is really screwed up. So I'm allergic to almost everything out there that they test for. This is the deal. We have just landed. The way it happened in reality, a whole bunch of the Americans ended up in the British drop zone. So we're fighting together. However, we are still keeping our integrity as per the real operation. The Americans will stay on the right flank throughout this day. The British will stay on the left flank throughout this day. The vehicles in front, the infantry in ground and back, then we will fire a second smoke screen that will be closer to the German positions. Anybody got any questions? 
No questions? We noticed we'd be out for a weekend and not long after that I'd end up in the hospital. Get back out and then go out another weekend uh, out there playing around outside and I'd end up in the hospital again and uh, so uh, I've been going through immunotherapy and some hospital stays and this, this is all desert storm stuff, you know. Um, is that like Gulf War syndrome? Yeah. Yeah. I ish, you ish, know. Yeah. You know, depleted uranium poisoning and nerve agent poisoning and all that. It's all documented. But yeah, so anyway, here we are. And now back in the movie business. <laughs> <laughs> Old Willie, he thought out this design, you know. Seafoam, it's a treatment for gas. Uh, it keeps it from going stale, because gas, if you leave it long enough, it varnishes up, and uh, that dissolves the varnish and stuff. So, since it's been sitting here, Eleven six nine. Does it keep in charge? Well, I don't know. What I'm going to do is uh, shoot some carb cleaner down it. Many wonderful hours in this day. Oh, dog! How'd that feel, Dan? Oh, it felt good. Yeah, it did it. I haven't driven it. Uh, reverse is straight up. Reverse. First, neutral. And second, then third. Um, and then when we're actually on set, we can figure out a way in the route to have a coast. Right. Are you recording all this? Yeah. Oh, for, in, for insurance purposes. Does that look good? Does that look all right? <laughs> you look great, man. You look like you and McGregor. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
driving that Jeep has been one of the coolest experiences just because they don't make it like they used to. Out here in the terrain, it's really not that forgiving <laughs> out here driving it. So uh, that's definitely been one of the coolest things in decking out the Jeep and uh, very much to the aesthetics and uh, what the SAS had in North Africa as well. The name that uh, I kind of gave it, the nickname is uh, Shelby. It's based off uh, Peaky Blinders uh, for Thomas Shelby. It's rugged, rough around the edges, but that bitch will get you out of out of harm's way if needed, and it could take a licking for sure. Shelby's quite reliable. Fixing up the Jeep was interesting. We started that like in January as well. I'm not mechanically inclined, so I painted it first and started rigging up jerry cans on it and stuff. And then uh, Danny came into the picture and helped me fix it up the rest of the way. And then he got good at driving it, <laughs> thank God, because I'm not very good at driving old equipment like this, you know? Like, I can drive a standard, but this is a little different. It had been sitting for almost three years, not driven at all. And once uh, uh, me and Dan got it running for the first time, it was like, all right, you know, let's start it up. You know, need a new battery, you needed, uh, the, the brakes needed to be bled, and uh, brake fluid changed. But other than that, I mean, it was like not bad, you know? So, and now it's running great. I've been a costume designer for, you know, 20 plus years. World War II got me into costume design. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm sorry. What? Go back. I think this is a Field Marshal Rommel's hat. One of his hats, one of his many hats that he wore throughout uh, World War II. Insignia is silver, which is what they did up until about 1942, 1943 for generals. And then eventually they changed silver to gold. So you can kind of date that hat by, by that. And the hat that I'm putting Ronald in our movie is going to be very much like that hat right there. But it's pretty neat that it's right down the street here in Austin, Texas. <laughs> yeah, let's get some close-ups.
<clears throat> Fix your left side. No, your hat. A little bit. Let's see. Perfect. Okay. <coughs> all noises. There's parts. Ever get it all out. <laughs> Alright, hold on. Oh god. Yavo. Mind fewer. Nope. <laughs> I've been promoted. Hey. Sorry. <laughs> Hi to me! Oh, 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 oh my god! A stunning display, Herr General. Danke, Herr Field Marshal. Backing up. <laughs> I've been promoted again! <laughs> I'm just doing great work! Yeah. Oh, yeah, Don, you have a raging erection this whole time. We just can't so see just, it, yeah, but just right. so you know, you've got a murder boner. So. Murder, so. murder boner. Yeah. Breaking the table. I want to ask Google Translate what German for murder boner is. <laughs> Head back to Nazi base. For me, it's like been awesome to see just the SAS come together and fight in the desert, and uh, kind of taken by by that whole aspect of like uh, British special forces and special units and stuff like that that didn't operate like regular army units and were small groups of guys that just raided airfields and. Uh, just wreaked havoc behind German lines in North Africa. Shooting here in the quarry has been, been awesome, and that was another find that me and Danny found one day. And uh, the guy who runs the place was just gracious enough to let us shoot here. And we've been out here probably like a dozen times at this point. This actually, where we're sitting right now, is the place they shot uh, Fear of the Walking Dead last seasons. It, I think they built like a fake uh, oil tower that was here. The cliff over there was all scorched. And there was like a shack they had over here, but they tore that down or that one of the construction companies tore that down and used it for something, but it kind of cleared up the area for us to be able to shoot in. And I'll tell you what, they kind of trashed this place. <laughs> we found like leftover scraps of pyro, bags of trash, work gloves, just like, you name it, just piece, pieces of random shit, you know? It was like pretty, pretty, pretty funny how like, a, you know, let's say Hollywood crew operates and kind of like leaves all that shit there. Rolling camera! Ready! Rolling! And action! And cut. I mean, I've always thought that small crews were, were, were more capable than bigger crews. I've, I've been on a lot of sets that were small budget, but they applied this big budget to them. So they had, all, they had like, you know, 20, 30 people standing around. I just thought they moved really slow. I thought it was kind of pointless. Like the amount of content they were getting per day wasn't as much as like we're able to get, you know, with just like a handful of people. You know, I, I think we've formed the ultimate guerrilla team for stuff. And I think uh, we can go on looking into the future with a little bit more crew and, you know, not taking on so many responsibilities ourselves will free us up to really concentrate on other things, you know, that we can just make this, you know, better. Bet you didn't think I was a jib operator, did you? <laughs> Dar, welcome to the uh, chaos. Thank you. What are you thinking of it? This is excellent, man. Great location, great production value. I have high hopes for this going full season. Oh, yeah, he does. So, basically, I'm just coming around the corner. Yeah, I said Donkey Donkey. He's been out here for a while. In the background. Are you enjoying the shoot so far? Oh, it's great. You know, just losing 10 pounds in sweat. Yeah. Just just getting that body goal for the, for the ladies. Mm -hmm. How are you? Is he blowing the gun? <laughs> you blowing the gun, Waka? There you go. So this is a Webley uh, Mark VI. It was designed at the end of uh, World War One. Shaved down the cylinder in World War Two to be um, fed with uh, moon clips, uh, regular 45 ACP. Man, I think it's crazy, man, but we're making hot. You know what? It's good shit. That's why it's kind of funny I can hear it echo. You know what that is? My soul. 
resonating. Your glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> Better. Better. These here are going to simulate grenades. How cool is that? Like, on demand. Looks pretty good, man. It's going to blow up right through it. Hi there, I'm Jason Shilton, writer and producer on Desert Terror. The original concept for Desert Terror came about as a short film when Matt Poitras decided he wanted the SAS to fight a crazy Nazi drone in the desert. Oh, we lost both our guys this easy? That's a nasty death scene? That was weak. Get him in the ankle too. Do one more thing. <laughs> see a dick wiggle in front of Matt's face.
Great shoots, uh, great explosions. You know, we had jerry cans flying 20 feet across the set. <laughs> so, in the, uh... <clears throat> but yeah, overall, it's been uh, a lot of insanity, but really great shoots. No one got hurt. Yet, we have one more thing to do tonight, which in involves blowing up a jerry can. That's a good beer. You guys are officially refs. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm not dead yet. I'll be back, John.